So what do you think? Uh, all of those individual laws, Boyle's, Charles, Avogadro's, blah, 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 they really are all encapsulated in what's called the ideal gas law. And this is one of the most uh, potent, I would say, equations in chemistry. Because if you understand how the ideal gas law works, you can control gases, you can predict what they're going to do to a high level of degree of accuracy. <clears throat> um, here are the five terms of the ideal gas law. Pressure, P, volume, V, N is amount, which is moles for chemistry. R, we'll talk about a little bit, is just a number. And T is the temperature. Now, <clears throat> depending on the value of R, uh, you'll use different parts for P, V, N, and T. But usually, in this class and in chemistry classes, P is pressure in atmospheres, the ATMs. V is the volume in liters, N will be moles, and T will be the Kelvin temperature. And if you understand this kind of stuff, uh, it's amazing how well it works, really. It's not perfect, but it's amazingly powerful, which is cool. Um, this is just a cheesy video. This person's pumping a gas uh, tire up. Oops. Quantity and volume are directly yeah, right. Uh, this one, sorry. A bicycle pump forces air into the confined space of the tire. As more air is added to the tire, the pressure increases. The tire's volume increases slightly, and the air becomes warmer. These observations are predictable properties of gases, and, as we explore in this chapter, they are described by the gas laws. So a simple act of filling a tire up is actually another exercise in the ideal gas law. So you go to Les Schwab and stuff like that, you could actually practically use some of these things. But anyway, R is the new player here. And R is called the universal gas constant or the gas constant. Now in a normal Chem 222 class, I would want you to memorize this version especially of R. 0 0.082057, and that's the one we're going to use in this chapter almost exclusively. I will call this the gas R because it's used almost all the time with gases. Um, in later chapters, though, we're going to use another version of R. If you change liters atmospheres into joules, which is something that in physics happens pretty readily, the number changes as well. 8.3145 is the value for R if you use joules per mole Kelvin. And that's also going to be helpful to us. We're going to use this one in future chapters, while this one's really important for what we've got right now. But you can have other kinds of R's, all right? And uh, in other classes, you might use some of those, and that's fantastic. But for us right now in this class, uh, 0 0.082057 is going to be the name of uh, the one that the important. So this R is actually something that's going to follow us now for a while. It's just a constant, all right? Pops up a lot of different places. This one, 0 0.082057, is going to be used a lot with the gases. The other one, 8.3145, I'm going to call that the energy R, because a lot of these equations with energy involved are going to use this one instead of this one. It's not a big deal. You can convert one to the other, but that's more fun than we need to do right now. Any questions on that? Okay. <clears throat> so this is a type of a problem you might see from something like this. Um, there's elaborate diagrams in math and engineering and stuff like that. I'm trying to find the volumes of rooms and stuff like that. We're not going to go that crazy. But what we are going to do is we're going to try and fill this small room with nitrogen. And our small room has a volume. Now here's the cubic feet, feet cubed. Uh, if you can use liters, definitely use that. It's a lot easier. You don't have to convert over. <clears throat> anyway, someone converted this over. 960 cubic feet is 2.70 times 10 to the fourth liters. And if you can use liters, that's easier because the R constant has units of liters in it. All right? So the liters would be the best one here. All right. So we're going to fill this room with that volume with nitrogen, and the pressure of the gas is going to be important. Like, do you have just a little bit or a lot? 
and we want a pretty good pressure. We want 745 millimeters of mercury. Now an atmosphere of pressure is 760, so that's a pretty, pretty powerful pressure there, but no problem. And the temperature is important. The temperature we'll say is about room temperature, which is about 25 degrees Celsius. And the question is how much N2 is needed? <clears throat> All right, well, if you go back to ideal gas law, all right, they gave us the volume, and the volume is in liters. R here, the one that's very useful in this chapter, liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Now, knowing that it's liters, atmospheres, moles, and Kelvin, we'll have to convert our pressure in millimeters of mercury into atmospheres, and that's the 760 millimeters of mercury equals one atmosphere of conversion. And because the temperature here is in Kelvin, when we use this R, we're also going to turn Celsius into Kelvin as well. So we'll add 273 to that number to make it Kelvin. And once we do that, we're going to solve for amount of gas, N, which comes out in moles. And from moles, we can turn it into grams, kilograms, whatever, uh, using the molar mass of N2. <clears throat> Any questions on that game plan before we get into the actual specifics? Okay. So, first part of these kind of problems is just to make sure everything's in the right unit. The liters is good to go. That's not a problem. But temperature, remember temperature always has to be Kelvin. So 25 plus 273 uh, to the first place doubtful digit would be 298 Kelvin. And the other thing we've got to do here is turn the pressure into atmospheres. So in this problem, we have 745 millimeters of mercury, 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere. This comes out to be 0 0.980 atmospheres. So that's the pressure we're going to have within the room uh, when we fill it up with nitrogen. So liters, Kelvin, atmospheres. We've got R. Temperatures in Kelvin, these in liters, P is now in pressure. So we're going to the next slide, we're going to solve for the moles, the amount of gas we need to pump in. All right, so N equals PV over RT. We'll throw in the values we calculated on the last slide. The pressure P, 0 0.980 atmospheres. The volume V in liters, 2.70 times 10 to the fourth. Here's the R constant, 0 0.082057. And here's the temperature, 298 Kelvin. Um, when you look at the pieces going in, three sig figs for 0 0.980, three sig figs for 2.70 times 10 to the fourth. 298 here is three sig figs. And R has five sig figs. So the answer, the moles we want to cut it off to would be three significant figures. That's 1.08 times 10 to the third moles. If you're talking about this problem though to a boss, they probably won't know about moles, but they probably will understand grams, kilograms, pounds, stuff like that. So if you took this number, the moles, and you multiplied by the molar mass of N2, which is about 28 grams per mole, you can get the grams and divide it by 1,000 to get this number right here. Notice that if you look at this problem, it looks like a two sig fig number, 25, all right? But if you remember back from Chem 221, if you convert Celsius to Kelvin, add, in theory, 273.15 to it. So this number comes up to be 298.15. But when it comes to significant figures and adding and subtracting, you look for the last digit of the number, which I call the doubtful digit. And you want to make sure your answer is cut off at the larger doubtful digit, the number most to the left on the number. So the five is at the one spot. This is a hundredth spot. That means we cut this off, and the best answer here would be 298 Kelvin. And 
the theory is, is that we don't know is 25.00, is it 25.49, all right? What are these numbers right here? And they're not given. So we have no confidence in the tenths or the hundredths position. So we can't call it just 298.15, all right? But we do go from a two sig fig to a three sig fig answer, and that's pretty common in these problems. So just realize that a lot of times, temperature especially, will go from a two sig fig to a three sig fig. That's why we're using three sig figs. Oh, Chem 221. Any questions on any of this? All right. If any of you are too shy to ask, and I'm not, you don't have to raise your hand, man. You are welcome to email me later and say, yo, Russell, I, I'm totally lost, and I will help you find this kind of stuff. All this stuff is stuff you've done, and it's not hard, it's just kind of annoying. And we haven't done it for a while, so it's a little dusty, but we'll dust it off, get it all good for everybody here and stuff. Um, <clears throat> the other cool thing is that this is a type of a problem. If you really wanted to fill this, half this little room here with nitrogen, <clears throat> this would tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, how much nitrogen you would need to get it in there, so. Questions? Now, there's lots of uses of gases, and another use you can do now is with things with what's called stoichiometry. And stoichiometry just means amounts, all right? Figuring out the right amounts for making different things. Um, here's a problem where we're starting with a liquid. This is hydrogen peroxide. And if you go to the store and you buy hydrogen peroxide, it's usually in a brown bottle, and they say to keep it uh, cool, don't use it at room temperature usually. Um, the hydrogen peroxide does break down over time. It breaks down into water and oxygen, and usually there's enough energy in the process to make it a gas. So in this problem, you're starting with a liquid, 1.1 grams of hydrogen peroxide and the volume of the flask that you have the hydrogen peroxide in, 2.50 liters. So this question says, what is the pressure of the O2 and the water at 25 degrees Celsius? So you let this hydrogen peroxide break down, and in theory, all of the liquid would go away, and you would only see, well, you wouldn't see anything, probably you just have gases in your flask. So the question is, from this much hydrogen peroxide, what will be the pressure of water and what will be the pressure of oxygen? This is the kind of thing that you think about when it comes to gases. And why this is different is stoichiometry means using these big numbers in front, the stoichiometric coefficients, to turn, say, moles of hydrogen peroxide into moles of water or moles of hydrogen peroxide into moles of oxygen. And from there, we can start going crazy. Any questions on that? All right, this is actually relevant. Um, this beetle, and again, I don't know what insect from the uh, bombardier, I guess, bombardier, anyway, whatever. Apparently, it uses hydrogen peroxide in its propulsion system. So it stores the liquid, because liquids are pretty handy for storing things, and somehow turns it into the gases, and the gases make then the stuff kind of spray out and stuff like that. So, woohoo, Mother Nature's got all kinds of tricks up her sleeve, man. But uh, anyway, that's kind of what we're doing here. This is just a more boring science thing. We're starting with the pure hydrogen peroxide in a flask, and we're just watching it decompose to figure out what the pressure would be. By the way, the pressures will always be units usually of atmospheres, so we're after atmospheres here. That's gonna be our unit we're looking for. <clears throat> okay, so to figure out something like this, <clears throat> first of all, gas law, PV equals NRT, only works for gases, and that's probably simple, but I wanna make sure that's clear. It would not work on liquids like hydrogen peroxide, and it would not work on solids, all right? Gas law is for gases, and that's sometimes something that people don't see. We would, so we won't use PV equals NRT on this, but we will use it when it comes to the water and the gas here. Remember, the G means gas, LIQ means liquid, stuff like that. So what I would do, first of all, is I would find out how many moles do we have, all right, how many moles of hydrogen peroxide specifically do we have, 
And then we can use stoichiometry, which means a two to two ratio or a two to one ratio. We'll use stoichiometry then to find moles of water and or moles of oxygen based on the amount of hydrogen peroxide we have. And once we have the moles, then we can use ideal gas law. We'll use PV equals NRT and we'll solve for P. The V is this 2.50 liter number. The N will be the moles of oxygen or water that we calculate based on peroxide. T is going to be the temperature. And remember, turn Celsius into Kelvin. And good old R here, 0 0.082057. So grams to moles hydrogen peroxide, and that will lead to moles of O2 and moles of water. And we'll have two different like calculations, if you will. One will be for the pressure of water, one will be for the pressure of oxygen. Any questions? We're going to use 25 degrees Celsius a lot because that's supposed to be room temperature. So 25 plus 273, 298, all right? So one thing that help, hopefully will help you a little bit is that if you see 25 Celsius, that just means 298 Kelvin. The other ones you can absolutely calculate like we did here on the board, but it's just an FYI. Okay, so let's turn the grams of H2O2 into moles of H2O2. <clears throat> Now, hydrogen peroxide has a molar mass <coughs> excuse me, of 34.0 grams per mole. And how I got that number is I looked at the periodic table. H2O2 has two oxygens and two hydrogens. Oxygen, roughly 16 grams per mole. And there's two of them. That's what the two means. So that would be 2 times 16, about 32 grams per mole. Now, hydrogen, on the other hand, is about one gram per mole. So one gram times two would be about two. That's where this number comes from, roughly 34 grams per mole, all right? <clears throat> you can use a molar mass calculator, either online or they've got them for phones and computers and stuff like that uh, to do this quickly, but you can also do it yourself. You don't have to go um, too crazy on sig figs. This is only a too significant figure problem. Um, so as long as you have basically three or more right here, you're fine. You don't have to go 34.000000 or something like that. But anyway, 1.1 divided by 34.0, 0.032 moles of hydrogen peroxide. That's all of the H2O2 that we start with. Um, any questions? How we found molar mass? Okay. Now at this point, we could find, take the moles of H2O2 and convert them into moles of water, or we could take the moles of H2O2 and move them into moles of oxygen, and either one is fine. In this example, because I wanted to show off stoichiometry a little bit, I'm going to do oxygen first, but there's nothing wrong with doing water. Um, stoichiometry is literally just the big numbers in front relative to each other. And in, to get to moles of oxygen, we have this much H2O2, and the balanced equation up here says two H2O2s will make one oxygen. There's an invisible one right there. And those stoichiometric coefficients, which is what this part is right here, is literally that. It's just the big numbers, all right? So the two moles of H2O2 comes from this two, and the invisible one right here means one mole of oxygen comes from two moles H2O2. So 0 0.032 times one half, basically, 0 0.016 moles of O2. What would be our ratio if I had picked water instead of oxygen? What would be the ratio right here between the water and the H2O2? One to one, two to two, outstanding, well done. If you had done water here, that's a two to two or one to one ratio, that's right. So instead of one to two, you'd have two to two. Uh, we'll see in a little bit that you'd have 0 0.032 moles of water made from that. Any questions on this? We haven't done this for a while, so I wanna make sure. Sweet. Okay, so now for oxygen, 
we're going to have P equals nRT over V by rearranging ideal gas law. So the N now is the moles of gas we just calculated, that 0 0.016 number. R, 0 0.082057. Temperature, 298 Kelvin, because it comes again from 0.5 Celsius, divided by the volume in liters, which is 2.50 liters. So this is just a plug and chug kind of problem. Your calculator will be your friend. Anyway, pressure to two significant figures because of the moles, 0.16 atmospheres. So when 1.1 grams of H2O2 decomposes, you're going to end up with a pressure of oxygen, 0.16 atmospheres. Any question? Cool. So when the beetle breaks its liquid down or whatever, it's going to create 0.16 atmospheres of pressure just from the oxygen alone, which is kind of cool. Okay. Again, you could have done the water first if you wanted to. I did the oxygen first. There would have been nothing. In the next slide, we're going to start talking about how to get this value for water, all right? And really, the difference between this calculation and the one for water, the R will be the same, the temperature is the same because it's the same flask, and because it's the same flask, it's the same volume, the same volume of the flask as well. So the only thing that would differ would be the moles of water, all right? And remember how we saw how the oxygen was 0 0.016, and that came from the 2 to 1 or the 1 half ratio, but water was 2 to 2. So it wouldn't be too hard to figure out this new value for the moles of water. But there's another thing you can do in this problem, too. In Avogadro's hypothesis, we talked about how as quantity moles goes up, the volume goes up. And I made kind of a quick comment how as the moles go up, your pressure will also go up as well, all right? So these two are proportional. And the other parts, by the way, have to be constant. So when it says the volume and moles are proportional, then temperature and pressure are constant. Or what's going to be helpful to us here, pressure and moles are proportional if temperature and volume are constant. Now in this problem, the volume is just the flask. It's not changing, it's constant. The temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, we're not heating it up or anything. So this works really well. And notice here how one oxygen and two moles of water came off. So the ratio of water to oxygen, two to one, all right? That's the moles, that's really what the end part's all about. As we go from oxygen to water, we're doubling the moles. All right, one mole of oxygen is going to create at the same time two moles of water. And if the two to one ratio works for moles, that means two to one is going to work for pressure. So if the pressure of the oxygen was 0.16, like we saw on the last slide, and there's this two to one ratio, the water should be twice as big. So it should be 0.16 times two or 0.32 atmospheres. And I know this might feel like, ooh, little black magic man, but seriously, go back and do the math if you want. It does come out to be twice as much. <clears throat> the ratio of the moles makes the H2O2 and water moles the same. So it was point, I forgot the number already. I can't short term memory. I did a lot of LDS in the 60s. But anyway, water then is going to have twice as big of a pressure as the oxygen did. So we're using here Avogadro's thing, how moles and pressure are proportional to each other, so we don't actually have to do the math. And I always encourage you to go and do the math if you don't believe me. It's totally fine. <clears throat> but if you do it, it does come out to be twice as much, 0.32 instead of 0.16. So to do this last part of the problem, you could have absolutely went back and found the moles of water based on the moles of hydrogen peroxide, and then P equals moles of water times RT over V. That would be one way to get this number. On the other hand, because port, uh, pressure and mole quantity are uh, proportional, as we go from one mole to two moles, O2 to H2O, the big one to the big two, the pressure should be twice as big as the O2 as well. 
either way works in this problem. Any questions on that? Okay. <clears throat> this example of how the pressures of the gases are proportional to the stoichiometries is best expressed in something called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. The air we're breathing right now <clears throat> is about 20% oxygen and it's almost 80% nitrogen. Most of what we're breathing in is actually N2, not oxygen. There's also a little bit of water, a little bit of argon. This is a mixture of gases that we're breathing in. And Dalton, the same Dalton, the Dalton who figured out some of the atomic theory and stuff, <clears throat> Dalton uh, figured this out. So what he realized is that if you had a flask, that 2.50 liter flask of H2O2 breaking down, <clears throat> We just calculated the partial pressures in the flask. <clears throat> the total pressure of the flask would be the sum of the individual pressures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 0 .3, 0 0.32 plus 0.16 is 0.48 atmospheres. So as hydrogen peroxide broke down, it was 0.16 atmospheres of oxygen and 0.32 atmospheres of water. And the total pressure in the flask 0.48 atmospheres. Gases don't mix that well. Well, excuse me, they mix and they don't interact. That would be a better way to say it. So the oxygen gas and the water gas, they will coexist and it makes the pressure greater totally, <clears throat> but they don't actually interfere with each other. Um, down here is an example, uh, just a little picture. Three different gases, each with their own pressure. Kilopascals is a type of pressure. And if you were to take these three and mix them into one container, you can see how now all the little different colored dots are inside there. You would literally add up these numbers here. <clears throat> so 600 plus 450 plus 300, 1350 kilopascals. The total pressure is the sum of the individual pressures. And that's what Dalton said. And that's the way gases almost always are. <clears throat> they don't react with each other. They're happy to coexist unless they're extreme acids and bases or something like that. Um, so you can take the individual pressures to find the total pressure of the flask. Any questions? Here's a question that kind of talks more about than Dalton's uh, thing here. Now, this compound, B2H6, is called diborane, something you need to know, but it reacts with oxygen. It makes what's called boric oxide, B2O3, and some water, all right? Now, in this part of the question, first of all, notice that we have one, two, three gases in this problem, all right? The diborane is a gas, We've got oxygen as a gas, the water is a gas, but the boric oxide is a solid. Okay, that's gonna be important. So in this problem, we're mixing diborane and oxygen in the correct ratio. And what that means is that for every mole of B2H6, we're gonna have three moles of oxygen, all right? They come out to be equal. And then it says the total pressure of the reactant mixture is 200 millimeters of mercury. So the question is, what's the partial pressure of each of the reactant gases? So <clears throat> let me try and make a little cheese diagram here. Um, we've got a flask. We haven't let it react yet, but right now it has B2H6 and O2. And the total pressure of the gas, 200 millimeters of mercury. And that equals the pressure of the B2H6 plus the pressure of the O2. So the question then is what combination here of B2H6 and oxygen are going to be allowed to give 200 millimeters? of mercury. And the question here relies on the fact that you have this 1 to 3 ratio, all right? 3 moles of O2 for every 1 mole of B2H6. So if you look at the first one, all right, if the total pressure is 200 millimeters, does this answer make sense? 
No, good. Why is this answer nonsensical? Exactly. You can't make something from nothing. The total pressure here would be 200 plus 66.7. That's larger than 200. So that answer, flat out. All right, A is not right. B is the same thing. Here you've got 200 and 600. That's like crazy, all right? So I'm letting you know that the answer is not E, all right? It's gonna be C or D. And if you look at C or D, notice how we have 150 to 50 or 50 to 150 ratios, okay? Now, what kind of ratio should we have if all of the reactants are stoichiometrically balanced? What to what would be the ratio, say, of oxygen to B2H6? Oxygen would be 3 to 1 to 2 h Outstanding. 3 to 1. Perfect. And Juliana didn't just wave a magic wand. She figured this out. The 3 there and the invisible 1 right there is where she got that. That's the power of these stoichiometric coefficients. So we need 3 to 1 oxygen to B2H6, all right? Now, there's several ways to figure out the answer here, but one way you can probably see is just you're gonna have to have more O2. Three to one means more oxygen than B2H6. You could also take three plus one, four. You could take 200 and divide it by that four, and that would give you like the millimeters of mercury for one piece and 200 divided by four is 50. That would be the pressure of the B2H6. And if you need three times that much, three times 50 would be 150. But either way, by hook or by crook, D should be the right answer. 50 millimeters of B2H6 and 150 millimeters of the O2. And again, why that makes sense, this is three O2s for one B2H6 and moles applies to pressure as well. <clears throat> so in terms of pressure, three times the pressure for O2 relative to B2H6, 50. Any questions? Okay. Chromium vapor is roughly five times more dense than air. It can be poured from one flask to another. The density of bromine, like that of all gases, is directly proportional to the molecular mass of its molecules in the gas phase. All right, so this tank over here, it even sounds different when we fill it up. So here, listen to this, it sounds different. Heavy. So and you feel heavy. this, it, is, it feels heavy too. It just it brought this back and forth and feel it. Oh, yeah. Really? So this it's is like full of water. Almost. Yeah. But it's got water in it. So, right. And it's just gas. All right, so the same thing you're going to do, but uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to exit uh, all your air goes out and then breathe in, and then I want you to do the intro to the podcast. Ready? Just keep tell, our, okay. tell our listeners at home uh, something of importance. Ready? All right, here we go. He's bringing in the air. He's right into his lungs. And See, now you can do that, but it's sort of, you're really doing that. You're not, there's no, you're behind the scenes. Yeah, that, it's filling your lungs, isn't it? It's filling my lungs. Yeah, yeah. Get yeah. 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 a breathe in. And then push it back out again. You're going to have to do that a couple times. Because that's what it has. Yeah, one more. Okay. There it is. Hello, y'all. <laughs> Did I make a bag of it?
there's a lot of fun videos on this subject, so I had to constrain myself there. But let's talk about uh, what's going on there so you can appreciate this too. Um, gases uh, have densities, just like liquids, solids, stuff like that. But we haven't really talked about what density of a gas means. Um, you can have balloons that float, and you can have balloons that sink. And maybe you bought like a balloon from a birthday place, and you brought it home, and it was really fun. But then after a while, all right, and what's happening is at first you have a gas which has a smaller density, and we'll see that if the density of your gas is less than air, it floats. So like helium is a great example of one you could buy, and those are really fun. And by the way, when you broke open a helium balloon, if you're a bad person, which I've done many times myself, and you, you suck it up, and oh, you talk like a chipmunk, right? And it's kind of dumb, shouldn't do it really, but I do it anyway. anyway Low density ones will float. On the other hand, bromine and this guy, sulfur hexafluoride, are gases which have densities larger than air, quite a bit more. This is the molar mass. This is grams per mole. That's what that means right there. Moles to the negative one is like moles in the denominator. So this SF6 is 146 grams per mole. You can actually pour it, all right, like a liquid. And I've seen this done in demos and stuff. They've actually taken gases like bromine, it's a great one because it's colored, and you can pour it from one container to the other. The bromine is a higher density air, and it tends to go down like a gas. Now, it's not like a liquid, all right, because it goes all over the place like all gases, but it's a lot different. Um, you can see that person there was sucking out SF6. It made his voice go low. And if you do helium, it makes it sound like a chipmunk. So the molar mass has an effect on our vocal cords as well. It's the opposite. But really cool was that last one, and they actually had a little like fish tank thing there filled with SF6. It's an invisible gas. And they put the little aluminum thing and it floated. <laughs> and it's not magic, right? That's true science. And then they scooped out the SF6 and poured it in there and the thing sank. Whoa. I tried so hard about 10 years ago to get a container of SF6. I wanted to try the depoys I invented. I wanted to show the little floating balloons and stuff. Well, SF6 is one of the really bad chemicals for ozone depletion, and it's really highly controlled. And even here at Mount Hood, I tried everything I could. I couldn't get a tank to try, man, which was a bummer. But anyway, in other places, obviously, they have enough to fill up a big tank of it. But on YouTube, there's lots of cool videos with SF6 and stuff, so. Um, we're going to see in the next slide that the density of a gas is proportional to the molar mass. So the more grams per mole you have, the higher the density will be. On the other hand, the smaller grams per mole, the smaller density you're going to have. Any questions on any of that? All right. Now, going back to the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. If you rewrite this a little bit, <clears throat> all right, we're gonna have pressure on one side, I'm gonna divide both sides, so RT is in the denominator. And then on this side, I'm gonna divide both sides by V. So I end up with moles over volume on one side, and on the other side, pressure over RT. Well, moles you can rewrite because the mass of a gas divided by the molar mass, which is what big M is here, is equal to moles. So let's say that we had, um, I don't know, eight grams of hydrogen, and the molar mass was one gram per mole, that would give you eight moles, roughly. So we're rewriting moles here as the mass over molar mass. So capital M here in these problems is gonna equal the molar mass of your gas the grams per mole. <clears throat> anyway, if you rethink about this even more, the mass of the gas, grams, divided by the volume, mass over volume, is density, all right? So M over V is density, big M is molar mass, and so what people do a lot of times is they rewrite this. The density is the little mass, grams, divided by the volume, this is the density part, and that equals, when you rearrange all this stuff, PM over RT. So the way that helps me remember this equation is I rewrite it as PM equals DRT. PM is evening, 
dirt. It's like dirt without the I. Woohoo! The evening dirt equation. Woohoo! And why that's kind of cool is because this is an alternative now to the ideal gas equation. And this is helpful if you have the density of the gas and or the molar mass of the gas. You can find one from the other pretty readily. Um, densities of gases are usually expressed in grams per liter. And that's different from the liquids and solids we looked at last quarter, where the, gram, or the densities were either grams per milliliter or grams per centimeter cube. So when it comes to gases, just realize density is going to be grams over liters. That's the difference of the gas density versus the other kinds of density. Any questions on that? One thing that's cool here is I said earlier how as molar mass goes up, the density goes up. And this equation is perfect for that. Um, <clears throat> these equations of the M and the D are on opposite sides. So one goes up, the other one goes up. So bigger molar masses will have higher densities. Those are the ones you can pour. On the other hand, smaller molar masses like helium at four grams per mole will have smaller densities and they'll tend to flow easier too. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a question you might see. It says, which of these gases has the greatest density at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure? Well, the punchline of this problem is because PM equals DRT, molar mass M is proportional to the density. So if we're looking for the greatest density, we want the greatest molar mass. So for all of these, oxygen, 16 times two, about 32, 14 times two, about 28, one times two, about two grams per mole. CO2 is about 44 grams per mole. Since I've done that so many times, I kind of know that. On the other hand, xenon, number 54 on the periodic table, 131 grams per mole. And that's a much bigger number than these other four I just mentioned. So for this one, xenon would have the highest density. <clears throat> the molar mass will tell you which one has the largest density. Biggest molar mass, biggest density. So xenon would be one you can pour. It would turn your voice deeper in theory. I don't think you want to do it if you don't have to. Anyway, any questions on that? Okay. Chemists will sometimes talk about what's called standard temperature and pressure. And there's uses for it, and we'll talk about what they are. <coughs> um, STP is something specific for gases. It's not for energy, which is what most of this class is about. It's only for gases. And for whatever reason, which I'm not honestly totally clear, they picked a standard temperature of zero Celsius, which is 273 Kelvin. <clears throat> standard pressure, I understand, would be one atmosphere. So you're under standard temperature and pressure conditions for a gas. If you're at exactly one atmosphere, and your temperature is 273.15 Kelvin. Um, one use of this is that if you have one mole of gas and you figure out PV equals NRT, what the volume's gonna be, one mole of gas takes up 22.4 liters. And sometimes you'll see like a big beach ball like this, which is supposed to represent 22.4 liters. And this is a way to visualize what a mole of gas volume would be, <laughs> all right? And again, that's assuming you're zero Celsius, which you probably aren't. Um, it assumes the volume is correct, stuff like that. But it does kind of cool to see what a mole looks like, quote unquote. And I think that's the main use uh, for it. Um, <clears throat> so if you see anything about STP in gases, it's always 273 Kelvin, one atmosphere of pressure. Um, this part is nice if you have one mole at those conditions. But if you're at 298 Kelvin, you, you aren't at STP anymore. So realize this 22.4 liter value, which is thrown around a lot, it's really only if you have one mole of gas, if you're at zero Celsius, and you have exactly one pressure. However, it is kind of nice, like I said, to visualize what a mole of gas looks like, quote unquote. Any questions on that? Okay. So realize again that STP, that you know that 273 Kelvin, 
one atmosphere of pressure. So these would be something you can look up. Now, after this chapter, what normally a standard temperature is, is 298 Kelvin, room temperature. And for whatever reason, the gases chose 273. So this is only for the gas laws, STP. Most of the time, standard temperature is 298. I'm just the messenger. I didn't make these rules up. I'm honestly not sure why they chose one. Any questions? Cool. Um, <clears throat> here's a question. <laughs> it's kind of silly. Uh, Spock from Star Trek. All right, yeah, so like Star Trek, you don't have to know. Spock's one of the people in Star Trek. Uh, Spock has two moles of neural gas. Now, there's an old Star Trek episode where they con and his group took over the Enterprise, and they used neural gas to knock most of them out. So anyway, the question is here, if Spock has two moles of neural gas and Spock's at STP, what would be the volume of the neural gas, all right? Now there's two ways that you could do this, all right? The one way would just be to knock through the equations. Standard temperature, again, 273 Kelvin. Standard pressure, one atmosphere. And if you have two moles of gas, you could calculate V, all right? You'd use the R of 0 0.082, 0 0.056, all that kind of stuff. However, in this particular problem, uh, if you really are at STP, one mole of gas is 22.4 liters. So if Spock has two moles of gas and he's at STP, then this number times two, or 44.8, would be another way that you could figure out quickly how much volume this neural gas was going to operate at. Neural gas is just something silly and made up. Don't worry about that. But if you did have two moles of any gas at STP, it would be this number times two, 44.8. And again, there's nothing wrong with going back and calculating V equals NRT over P, and you should get 44.8. Any questions on that? You don't have to like Star Trek to do well in this class. Um, we're going to look at a couple of questions here on the kinetic molecular theory and how they apply to gases. And KMT is pretty important. Um, kinetic molecular theory is what scientists use to understand the differences between solids, liquids, and gases. And in Chem 221, I talked about how solids are kind of like uh, everything's kind of locked in place, but with a liquid, there's still connection, but they're more moving and gases are totally all over the place. Well, when it comes to the kinetic molecular theory in gases, we can get a little bit more precise. So for example, the molecules of a gas in the kinetic molecular theory are always moving around, all right? As long as you're not at zero Kelvin, which is again where all matter stops, we're gonna assume that your gases are constantly on the move. They're just like little jumping beams that go crazy moving. Pressure of a gas, like I said, comes from uh, things like pushing on you. So if you have a container, there's going to be a pressure in that container. And the theory is pressure is just nothing more than the molecules bouncing, if you will, off the container walls. So pressure is from the molecules literally like bouncing into the molecules, into you, into the container, whatever. That's what pressure is all about. That's why pressure is less at higher elevations, because you don't have as much of this stuff. Um, here's something that's kind of lukewarm valid, and it says that there are no attractive or repulsive forces between the molecules, and the collisions are elastic. Now, this is stepping a little bit closer into physics, but it's something that chemists need to know about. Um, if you have two molecules coming together, and they are elastic, that means that all of the energy they had before is somehow equal to the energy they have after. All right, there's no energy loss from friction or something like that. Um, in an actual gas, all right, most of the time these forces, the attractive repulsive forces will be pretty small. But we're gonna focus in the next chapter on something called intramolecular forces, IM forces. And that literally is some attractive and repulsive forces going on between molecules. 
So of these four parts here I'm going to talk about with a KMT, this one is okay, all right? It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. And we'll talk in the next chapter more about what happens when you have these intermolecular forces working on your gases. This last one says that the volume of the individual molecules is negligible. And that's pretty good. If you get down to zero Kelvin, I think it would be a problem to say that a gas molecule had no volume, all right? But overall, they're pretty small. Um, anyway, these four things are kind of the foundation of what a gas is, all right? What a gas means, why it's different from solids and liquids. Um, this one I know is a little weird. We'll talk more about these kind of things uh, in the next section. Um, are there any questions on any of these four? Okay. All right, now bear with me a little bit. In physics, kinetic energy, there's actually a couple different equations for it. One of them is kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. m is the mass and v is the velocity or speed. And another one of the equations from physics is 3 halves RT. R is the gas R, I talked about briefly earlier, and T is the temperature. And why this is important for what we're doing right now is it does make some differences in the types of gases. So first of all, the overall energy of any gas is going to be primarily dictated by the temperature. All right, your temperature goes up, your kinetic energy or energy will go up as well. On the other hand, your temperature T goes down, your kinetic energy is going to go down. And that's a big part of all gases. So, you know, today it's kind of cold, a little dreary. <laughs> my temp temperature's down. My energy isn't quite up to spar either. Caffeine's not kicking in. I'm not making too many cheesy jokes. So, so this is an example of how us and gases are the same. On the other hand, some days it's really nice outside and it feels like spring. Woohoo! Temperature goes up, your energy goes up. I feel more motivated and energetic. So gases uh, are kind of like me, I guess, which is kind of sad, but anyway, that's one way to think about it, all right? Temperature goes up, kinetic energy goes up, temperature goes down, the energy goes down, all right. However, the energy part has two pieces that affect it, and this is where it gets really interesting. The mass of the gas and the speed of the gas. Now, at any temperature, the energy of the gas is going to be the same. But let's say you had two molecules of gas, and one was small helium, four grams per mole, that would be like the M mass, and the other one is argon, 40 grams per mole, that would be the M right there. So argon is a big molecule, big molar mass, and helium is small. What this part says right here, remember the temperature dictates how much total energy there is. And if the, temp if the energy is the same for both helium and argon at the same temperature, well, little helium is going to have to have a bigger speed to make this part the same. Because if argon with a big mass is there, argon's going to go slower. So at the very end here, this is kind of the important part, at all temperatures, all gases have the same energy. But some gases are fast and some are slow. If a molecule is really small, it's going to be much faster because small mass times V is going to equal an energy. On the other hand, if you've got big mass, it's going to be smaller because if mass is big, then your speed is going to have to be slow. So when it comes to gases, gases are like people on the track, all right? Um, I don't know, uh, Caden, you're an athlete, man. So let's say Caden and I go to the track, <laughs> all right, and we're going to run, all right? Woohoo! Well, I had pizza this weekend. Caden's probably doing weights. So Caden's probably going to take off and go really fast because he's in good shape. He's got less mass, not as much pizza, and he's probably as fast, but maybe you do, it's okay too. Um, anyway, so Caden is light and faster, all right? I am heavier and slower, all right? And that's what it comes down to gases here too, all right? So heavier gases would be like me, they would be slower. Mass is higher, velocity has to be less. On the other hand, Caden has less mass, he's in good shape, so he's gonna go faster, his V is gonna be higher. So if you can get these two things, the next slides are just gonna basically re-say that. And again, let's go through this. 
temperature goes up, all gases energy goes up. But all gases have the same energy at the same temperature. So if you have a mixture of heavy gases and light gases, the light ones are going super fast and the heavy ones go really slow. All right? Question number. Some people like seeing the equations and that's totally cool. On the other hand, if you don't like them, I'm going to show you some videos. Um, by the way, this R is the energy R, quote unquote. It's not one we're going to use a lot this chapter, and we're not going to actually calculate the kinetic energy of gases or anything. However, if you were to do it, this is a higher chemistry or physics kind of thing, you would use the other R here. So. Okay, so let's watch some videos to kind of highlight what these different pieces are. Gas molecules are in constant motion and frequently collide with one another. Although not all the molecules in a gas sample move at the same speed, the higher the temperature of the gas, the greater the average speed and kinetic energy of the molecules overall. This higher level of energy allows molecules to disperse more readily, which is one reason we smell aromas better when temperatures are higher. So these two boxes, let's pretend for right now they're the same gas, but they're different temperatures, all right? So man, at the high temperatures, they're bouncing around. They're going crazy. Lower temperatures, going a little bit slower, all right? So temperature goes up, the energy of your gas is going to go up. And you can't change the mass of the gas, all right? Uh, mass is going to stay the same. So the speed will change as the temperature goes up. And uh, on the left, this is kind of cool. Some people uh, really like to have all their food heated up, you know, and that's why they eat it, which is fine. On the other hand, I'm like, oh, whatever temperature. But anyway, the reason, one of the reasons why I think they like it is because it's the higher temperatures, the smells are distributed better. So you can smell things and stuff uh, a little easier than you could before. So the hotter the temperature, the more movement, they have more energy. Is that cool? Questions? All right. Now, good old Maxwell, who did a lot of the wave equation, amplitudes and frequencies and wavelengths, all that stuff like that, created this equation. You do not have to ever use this in my class, but I want to show you where this stuff all comes from. Um, <clears throat> the square root of the speed squared is called the root mean square speed, and there's reasons in this kind of stuff why they do it, which is more than we need. Do it. Think of this as just a speed, and the speed depends on the temperature and the molar mass of the gas. All right, that's what this equation is saying. There's square roots, don't worry about that. There's R is the energy R. That's kind of the idea here. When it comes to the speed of a gas, it depends on the temperature and the molar mass. So earlier I saw how there's a cold and a hot temperature, and the hot ones were moving around really fast. That's the temperature part. Temperature went up and the speed, which is this thing, went up as well. On the other hand, if the temperature was lower, then the speed u would be slower and stuff. That's what this equation is saying. But the other part here is Caden and me on the track again. All right, as the speed, as the molar mass, excuse me, as the molar mass increases, and it's in the bottom, your speed will go down. So I had pizza this weekend, I have more mass, I'm on the bottom, my speed will be less. On the other hand, Caden, the great athlete, his mass is probably going down because he's exercising and thinking about his diet. His speed is gonna go up. They're inversely proportional, one's in the top and one's in the bottom. So the pull aways from Maxwell is not to throw things in this nasty equation, which you can do, it's just not more, more fun than we need. The speed, u, will increase as your temperature goes up. All right, forget the square roots, forget the squares, forget all that stuff. Just temperature and speed are both in the top part of the equation. So one goes up, the other one goes up. On the other hand, temperature goes down, your speed's gonna go down too. And the second thing is the Caden and Michael thing. <clears throat> uh, heavy mass Michael has higher mass, so the bottom here would be higher. My speed in the top part would be less. If things in the bottom get bigger, then things in the top get smaller. It's the opposite effect, all right? So in this case, then, light Caden would have a small mass. He would have a greater speed on the track. Um, these are just some notes. This is the R to use, which is a version of the energy R, and the molar mass has to be in kilograms per mole. You do not have to do these calculations, though, but in case one of you 
are interested, you can do it too. Um, this is a good place to take a break. Uh, it's about 10.56, so about 11.01. Uh, we'll come back, we'll finish this chapter, and we'll just barely begin the next chapter here.